was just the song that was supposed to bring you back into the sanctuary. What's up, guys? It is good to be here tonight. Are you glad to be here? Amen. I know Chris, uh, Brother Chris is. Anybody else? Amen. Not quite as much. Who's glad they're here? All right. I'm glad I'm here. There's a lot of good things that are happening right now, ministry-wise, and um, I just wanted to share some of that with you. Starting this week, starting Wednesday night, the church will be back to full-blown activities again. So, yeah, praise the Lord. Following all the protocols, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be using all our uh, PPE in uh, protective gear, uh, safety things for the children's ministry, um, as has been prescribed by our, our local government. But we'll have kids' ministries, preschool, nurseries, all that stuff starts back this week. Very excited about it. I know many of you from home have been waiting to come back just for that. So uh, just wanted to put that out there. I'll send a text out and communicate that a little more later. Uh, another thing that's starting back up is brunch. So next week, Father's Day, we're going to have an extra special brunch for our church family, specifically our men. So Father's Day, there'll be some, some extra meat on the table. And it's, we'll have people serving it. It'll be safe as well. You know, won't have everybody touching utensils and stuff like that. Always being very conscious with those situations. So anyway, uh, it's going to be fantastic brunch and Bible study, just as we typically do. It's going to be studying the book of Jonah. And we're going to have a panel of pastors up here talking about it. It's going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun. New ministries are beginning as well. As the church is vamping up and everything is coming back into action, uh, we've got new ministries that uh, our, our existing ministries that are going great. Also, we've needed are also starting back up, uh, are starting up, and one of those is called My Food. Does anybody know what the reference is for that? Jesus said, "My food is to do of the will of Him who sent me." My food is a grocery ministry that we offer to the people of this community, and we're going to be reconvening that on the twenty fifth of this month. That means we're going to go pick up the food, we bring it back, we sort it out, we give it away. People in the community that are in need of food and uh, can come by and they get a basket or bags and we fill them up and we send them home with free groceries. And it's just a practical way of saying we love you, Jesus loves you, and we want to serve you. And so if you'd like to be a part of this ministry on Thursdays, it'll be Thursday afternoons. There's more details on the board. We're going to pass this around. Brother Forrest is going to put a pin on it. And if you want to sign up, keep an eye on where that board's at. Sign up tonight, and uh, we'll be contacting you. Just put your phone number. We'll be contacting you. Another couple of new ministries. I don't have any clipboards for them yet, but we're talking about two new prayer ministries that we're going to do here at the church. One of those prayer ministries is going to be an internal prayer ministry where prayer cards, I want you to know something. These prayer cards that you guys have filled out on Power Nights, uh, these are prayed for weekly. And uh, as I go through them now, it's been a few months since we've had a prayer night, there are a majority of these cards are answered. It seems like a large majority because I know what's been answered and what hasn't for the most part. So it's amazing the power of prayer. It's a cliche, as I said a couple of weeks ago, that people say prayer is powerful. People really don't even know that because they don't do it. But when you actually do it and measure it and keep track of these things and write them down, you realize God is answering all of our prayer requests. And so it's important that we have a ministry in the church, I think, that does that as well. That these cards or different cards of some sort get deposited into. That people would come in on a weekly basis and pray over all of those needs. And then as they're answered, they set them aside as praise reports. And so if you'd like to be a part of that ministry, we're working on that. Right now, what we need is someone that will oversee it. Someone that will give some legs to it and help to carry it. So if, if you think that might be you, come and see me sometime, uh, talk to me after service, call me during the week, whatever, and uh, we'd like to put legs to that ministry and get it started. But there's another ministry that we already have a leadership in, and it's going to be starting soon, and that is a prayer ministry in the community, where we actually go into different parts of the community at different times, 
and we simply offer prayer for people in that community. We set up a tent. Uh, we, we have people out there from our church, and we're simply there to bless them. We pray over their needs. We pray for them. We pray with them. We maybe give them a gift like a Bible or something like that. And, uh, and then the next time we go out, we go to a different area. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, just keep in mind we're going to be having a clipboard out probably next week, maybe in two weeks regarding that. You can be a part of that ministry as well. These are very important ministries, the ministries of prayer. Amen. Finally, this. Who, did everybody get one of these when they came in? I want the family to have one. Miss Kimberly Vinegar, a lady in our community who is the president of the Boston Historical Society, and uh, she has contacted me a, a week or two ago and asked us to be a part of a prayer uh, fellowship. This is a prayer fellowship. Uh, some, people, some are calling it a prayer rally, and it says actually prayer rally on here. And all the churches, uh, many churches at least, have been invited uh, down to Boston, the black area or historically black area of our town, uh, as well as the sheriff's department, police department. I want you to know something. This is in, in, in no way a protest, uh, as I don't attend protests. Not that I'm against them, but I just don't attend them. Uh, it is all about prayer. Kimberly said there's a lot of stuff going on, but one thing that's not happening enough is prayer, unity and prayer. And so she said, we know that you are a black church, and we would like you to join us at the Boston community uh, so that we can pray together. And so many of our, our leadership and other churches are going to be joining us as well. I'll personally be leading in some prayers. And then we're going to just walk together in unity with the police department, with the other churches in town, down to the courthouse. And uh, not a protest thing, just simply to pray and show that we stand side by side as brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. So I want you, as a member of this church, as a part of this community, to join me. It's Saturday at 12 noon. And I want to show that we are brothers and sisters in Christ and that we stand together in unity. Amen. So mark this on your calendars. Make a point to be there. We're not there protesting. No one's there doing those. That's not what this is about. This is about simply praying together in unity. Okay. I want you to be there. I want to see you there. If you've already got plans. You're going out of town. I get it. It's okay. But if you don't already have something going on, don't put something in the spot. Come do this with us. Okay. I really, really want you to do this with us. Praise the Lord. We look forward to seeing you there next Saturday for that uh, community prayer rally at Boston Park. By the way, that's on Chambers Avenue at Fiery Police Station. And there's also some basketball courts and things up there at the park. So that's where we'll be meeting. So I hope you can come for that. Right now, we want to wait upon you for the Lord's tithes and your offerings to him. Why do we tithe? Good answer. Good answer. Out of the mouth of babes. Besides that, by the way, what is tithing? This is my boy. That's my boy. Giving 10% of the income to the work of the Lord. That's tithing. What we give above that is offering. There are two other reasons mentioned in the Bible as to why God's people tithe. Uh, it started in the book of Genesis. It goes all through the Bible. It's not just an Old Testament law concept. It started again with Genesis. But also God told Moses to explain to the people of Israel there's two reasons why you tithe. The first reason is the covenant of faith. That's that. Every time we write the tithe check, we're saying, God, it's not just your word you're putting your money in your mouth with. Really, it's not your money. It's God's money. Because all of it belongs to God. And the 10% is what you say is a token of trust. I give this to you, God, because I trust you. So it's the covenant of faith. The other reason is the covenant of reverence. God, Moses also was told by God to tell the people of Israel they should tithe, teach them to tithe, so they will learn to fear God. So every time we write that tithe check, we're saying to God, God, I reverence you above all else in my life. I put my trust in you, and I show you reverence, not just with my words, not just with songs, but in my actions and in my money. It's your money. I reverence you, God. And that's a wonderful act of worship, faith and reverence to God. It's a wonderful act of worship. Thank you for your giving in tithes and in offerings. There's three ways to give. You can give online, mychurchgeorgetown.com, and then check the give option. You can also give on the kiosk. It's back there on the dark blue wall, and next to that is a gray box where you can actually put the check. Uh, if you've used cash, please use an envelope so that you can, so we can know what it's for, your name, and uh, that you want us to know that. Some folks don't, but 
he can give you credit for uh, charitable giving if he lets us know your name and how much that is. So put that on the envelope. We appreciate that. Right now, let's ask God's blessing upon this tithes and offering. Father God, life is better when we trust you and when we fear you in every way. Not just the money, but every way, oh God. There's no better way that we have you in Jesus but to trust and obey the old, old gospel song. So, Lord, tonight we worship you with your tithes and our offerings, God. We pray, God, that you'll bless your people as they trust you, Father. We thank you, God, for it in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, the gentleman's going to come and receive. Oh, we're well, giving, right? We're giving tonight. Somebody got a bag or box or tray or something? No, we don't? Okay. Jeff's got a hat. Anybody else got a hat? That's the only, well, that's, where'd he go? Where'd the pastor go? Okay, I'm going to hum a song while you all give. Very good. The last time I did this, we passed out the giving to the offering bag too. So I'm going to exit stage left. <laughs> so whatever comes up is next. That's what the change is. Come on up, Doc. Yeah, I'm the old dog. I get kind of slow once in a while. Pastor always reminds me to tell people they can give from their seat, which means right now you can give on your phone by going to mychurchgeorgetown.com and put up the give option. Thank you, Pastor Terry, for explaining it to me. I forgot. God bless you all. You want this? You got one of your own. If I keep doing this bad enough, you'll make me quit doing it. Hello. It's a bad day. Dr. Spiegenspell had a terrible science accident last week and will not be joining us. I am Dr. Rushan Mann, ex-scientist. I was working in secret laboratory, as can be seen. It's not picture, but imagine secret laboratory. Many animals housed in secret laboratory and in cages, both big and small. And I had favorite little puppy. I named him Duke. They said, do not name animals. I named all the animals. <sighs> An ex-scientist. I set the animals free. Whoops. All the animals. There are no more animals. <sighs> the, the, the king scientist got very upset. He said, how dare you? Uh, can I have some helpers? I need some children helpers. Helpers, raise hands. If your hand's up, come on up front. Make this scientist, oh, ex-scientist, <laughs> a happy man. But children, uh-oh. So, one thing that happened, I have to protect self from children. You carry many diseases. So, you do the animal noises? I need one of you to be puppy dog. Who wants to be Dutch? Duke. I forgot his name and I let him go. Heidi, do you wish to be puppy dog? Heidi, can you give me best puppy dog bark? Bork, bork, bork. Can you make doggy noises? The roof. A roof. Ruff. Excellent. Can you run them like puppy? Go run to seat like puppy. Like puppy. Who who go, who does good monkey? Who's a good monkey? Who wants to be monkey? S Lady with red hair looks like she could do good monkey noises. Oh, oh, e, e. Ah, ah. Now, give me, give me monkey run back to seat. Go run to seat like monkey. Big animal we let go was hippopotamus. Give me best hippopotamus. 
That's a good hippopotamus. <laughs> Wonderful. Can you run to can you run to see like hippo? Run to see like hippo. Wonderful. Snake. They got mad at me. I let so many snakes go. <laughs> Little girl make snake noises. Now, regal back to seed like snake. That is not how snakes walk. Snakes don't walk. You use legs like a person. Oi. And the worst one Dutch 2. The sequel to Dutch. He was my favorite toucan. Can you make toucan noises? Follow your nose. Toucan, come on. None of you are, none of you are too old or young to know that. What's favorite toucan noise? Falling on crackers. That is not toucan. <laughs> Give me good bird. Give me your best. <coughs> now go to see like bird. No, come back, come back, come back. Sit down. Go back to see like bird. Go back to see like bird. No, come back. What is she doing wrong? Anybody, t anybody tell? What do birds do? They fly. Why are you walking? Are you saying that you are such a bad bird you cannot fly? Oh, no. Go do ostrich and run back to chair then. <sighs> Children are gone. Get rid of protective gear. Oy. Quaff. Magnificent mane. Lion was worst. <laughs> he chased on me. So I think he's the reason I got fired. S no science accidents that day, just regular accidents. But whole thing reminds story of a man named Joseph. That's Joseph. I made I made uh, uh, the picture A so you can see who talking. Cause anybody see who Joseph is? Joseph is one arrow pointing towards that says Joseph. Wonderful. Joseph had a coat. See? Joseph plus coat. Joseph and coat. Coat was of what kind of things? Many colors. So many colors. So Joseph had these brothers, right? Joseph's brothers were special. They were jerks. See? Arrow pointing to jerk brothers. Jerk brothers no like his coat, he think he's favorite, so let's throw him in well and father will love him less. <laughs> I can relate. Anyway, so jerk brothers throw into well and they take coat of what? Many colors. How many colors? <laughs> many. One, two, three. Anyway, throw into well and bring coat back to father. Bring coat back to father. There we go. Coat is back to father. They say, ha, son is dead. Uh, terrible wolf came and ate him in one bite. Do you know what they did? That is not Joseph blood. What kind of blood? It says animal blood. So it's animal blood. Father, very upset. Upset father. Joseph, dad, upset. So many years pass and Joseph becomes, he goes to Egypt and becomes a big important man. Show Joseph the, Joseph. And then one day, jerk brothers come back. Don't know it's Joseph. See, bowing, Joseph, jerk brothers. They're like, we hungry, we know you have food, you have prepared famine, there's a big story. Anyway, Joseph is mean, pretend. But then Joseph, something happens to Joseph in the next picture. Joseph still loves brothers, the jerk ones. So, Joseph decides to do something. Joseph has a moment where he's like, I must forgive and I must move on. Next slide will show that. This is post-mercy Joseph. Does anybody know what he has just done? 
What? I misspelled Joseph. It is Russian spelling. Don't worry. <laughs> Google, Google Translate not always care for what uh, uh, ex scientists have to do. But Post Mercy joins. This is Post Mercy. What did he just show? If it's Post Mercy, what just happened? Post Mercy. Post means after. What happens before a post? Get rid of two words from there and answer question. Mercy, wonderful. So Joseph's brothers show, or he showed mercy to Joseph's brothers, and he gives all hugs. It's all good. Duh. Forgiveness. So just like the time that he let all the animals go, because I had compassion, and one of them looked at me like this. I was like, no, don't do that. He's like, it was lion, and I feared him. But it, I also loved him. He was Dutch 3, sequel to Dutch 1 and 2. And I let go because I had mercy, and I had compassion. Joseph had mercy, he had compassion, forgave. Is forgiving brothers who throw you into well for death easy? No. Especially when they steal your coat of many colors. That was the most egregious crime. But who helped him show mercy? God. God is the one who allows us to show mercy. Now, I'm not saying that the mercy I showed has anything to do with what happened after, with firing, that is unrelated. I'm sure I'll come back next week and everything will be peachy. But remember, many bad things happen in life. But God help. God don't go away. It makes you show mercy. Because if you have bad feelings for someone who do something wrong to you, who are you hurting? Yourself. God helps that go away. So, in conclusion, think twice before letting go of all animals. The end. Let's pray together before we start singing and praising the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so glad that we get to be in your house with your people. All of us, Lord, we have been touched by our Savior. We have been, you have seen us at our worst, but God, you still give us your best love. Lord, every day we need that mercy that is new every morning and every day you are there to provide us. Every day, God, we need, your, we need your grace, we need your Holy Spirit, and you never fail to provide us. And as tonight, as we come together as one body, we want to give you all of our praise. All of our minds and our hearts are set on you right now in this room. We know, God, that you are here, that this is your sanctuary. You are here. Your presence is all around us. Hallelujah. Church, do you realize that his presence is all around us right now? Your word tells us, it guarantees that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there. And there is more than two or three of us tonight. Hallelujah. So God, as we get free, Lord, in our worship and in our praise, Lord, I pray that you would let your Holy Spirit rain down on us in this place. Lord, I pray that you would release your Holy Spirit, that you would release your power. 
all over us, all over this place, God, so that as we lift up our voices and sing, as we lift up our hands, as we sing and surrender, God, that we would know that our King is right there, that you are listening, that you are loving the praise that is coming from your people, that we would be able to feel your presence around us, that we would be able to feel your love, oh God. I pray for those of us who are empty and need a refreshing. I pray, God, that we come, we come empty, and we just say, God, pour it out in me. Pour it out on me, oh Lord. Hallelujah. God, we come here to give you praise. We come here expecting to be touched by you, and we are coming, Lord, to touch you with our worship. Amen, church. Live, sing, we give life. We give life. You are love. You are love. You bring life. You bring life to the dark. You give hope. You give hope. Shout your praise, our hearts will cry these 
There is no 
turn into praise. Shake off the spare as I sing out your name. Oh, victory dance, I will dance loud in faith. We'll crush disappointment and break every chain. All of my fear, I will turn into praise. Shake off the spare as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance loud in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. All of my Amen. All things are possible. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. God, we give you praise and we claim the victory in Jesus' name. Everybody says, Amen. You all may be seated tonight. got a wonderful message for you guys tonight you're going to enjoy from the scripture. It's in the Old Testament, and if you have your Bibles or your phone apps, turn with me tonight to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Also, if you're watching online, um, actually, if you have your phones on you tonight, turn to your Facebook page and also share this message. We've got everything moving and working on Facebook tonight. God, your God, is a God, a merciful God. God of mercy, and uh, it's a, something the Lord laid on my heart. He wanted me to share with you guys this evening. He's been speaking to me about this the last two or three weeks, as a matter of fact. And I know there's people out there tonight, and you've got to hear this. Uh, if you're at home tonight watching, I know there's many watching from home, you need to hear this tonight. This is a message specifically for the elect. Those are those whom God has called, God has chosen, his children. You could be following him tonight or not following him tonight and still be one of the elect. Matter of fact, if you're here tonight, that very position that you are in to be here, you, you are the elect. If you're watching tonight, you're the elect. You've been chosen by God. You wouldn't be watching this if you weren't. You wouldn't be here if you were not. And so this is a message specifically for you guys as you're watching and as you're here. Some of us struggle because we, we, we have a hard time seeing, seeing ourselves as that. But it's what the Bible tells us. So this is God's word tonight. It's the truth of God for you as hearers this evening. So the first thing is just simply here in, in the verse it says, For the Lord your God is a merciful God. It's not going to be... Long, it's going to be quick. If you're taking notes, I want you to take them quickly, okay? 
God is a merciful God. Sometimes uh, this word merciful is translated as compassionate. God is a compassionate God. This word is, is unique because there is only one person that this word is used in reference to in all of the Bible, and that is God. This is another level of merciful. It's always and only used of God himself. So it's a special kind of mercy. It's a special kind of compassion that only God is capable of. It's beyond our understanding or our use. Um, as a child, I grew up, and I didn't understand mercy, I guess, the way that I should have, and I blamed my father. Story coming. As a kid, well, let me just say now, fast forward, I hate to be tickled. If you tickle me, you will get hurt. And that goes for anybody. I've hurt my children. I've hurt my wife. They think it's funny to tickle. It's bad. It's not funny. My dad used to hold me down as a child. I could not move. He would tickle me until I would slightly pee myself. And he would tell me that I need to scream mercy for him to stop. I'm the type of child that I don't ever cry mercy. And so I would never cry mercy. I would never scream mercy. So he would continue to hold me down, tickle me. And to this day, I absolutely hate it. That's the one thing I would scream. I would scream mommy. And after, I don't know, depending on where she was at in the house, if you can hear me or not, five minutes, 15 minutes, she'd hear me and she would take a running start at dad and push him or pull him away from me and I'd be free and I'd run away. It was true. So I hated, you know, it's kind of like that game you played as a kid. Anybody play mercy with your hands and you try to squeeze the other person you had to say mercy? I was always real good at that. I don't know if I'd be good anymore, but I, I, that was my distorted view of mercy. Um, God does not torment us to get us to say mercy and request mercy. He doesn't force you to say it. Um, you don't have to pee yourself in order to receive it. It really actually has nothing to do with in relation to our story at all. And I don't think Dad was trying to teach me mercy either. It's just a game that he played. And I passed on to my children. Now they hate to be tickled. God has a huge capacity for compassion. He looks upon us with compassion and he pities us. And he doesn't want to give us what we deserve. Somebody needs to say amen to that. Because we know what we deserve. The Bible says the wages of sin is death and we deserve it. We've earned it. But he doesn't want to give it to us. And I thank God that when he looks at me, he looks at you. He loves us so much. He has pity on us. He doesn't want to give us what we deserve. Even though we know we deserve it. He has compassion upon us. Forgiveness and mercy. He is the king of not giving people what they deserve. He's got more compassion than you can imagine. He is more forgiving than you can humanly possibly understand. He is likely even more merciful than he is comprehensible. You'll probably sooner understand God than you will understand how deep his mercy is. So with that in mind, here's what this passage says. Because he's a merciful God, these are the things that he's going to do for you. And I want you to get this tonight, okay? The three things very quickly. For our God is a merciful God. Your God is a merciful God. He will not, number one, abandon you. He does not abandon you. He has never left you. He never will leave you. Even if you can't feel his presence, and we've all been there. Maybe you're there tonight. Maybe you're here watching tonight, and that's where you're at. You can't feel his presence anymore. God does not abandon us. You are part of his elect. You are part of his chosen. You are one of his children, and he never leaves you. Scripture tells us he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He never turns his back on us. Even when we don't feel him, he's there. So I want you to know that tonight. He has not abandoned you. He is with you. 
There's nothing that you can do to make him abandon you. You can't upset him, anger him, frustrate him, push him so hard that he would turn away from you. He won't abandon you. It doesn't matter what you've done, what you will do, he will not abandon you. If you know the Old Testament well, you might know the story of Hosea. Hosea was a prophet of God whom he called to, to prophesy, to preach. But more than that, he, he, he made him live an example of God's faithfulness. He had him marry a prostitute who would repeatedly cheat on him with different men. And Hosea had to be the God on this side, by the image of, be the image of God in this, in this uh, story and in his life. And he would always take her back. He would faithfully pursue her no matter what she did against him. He would never leave her, never forsake her, never forget about her, never turn his back on her, never divorce her, never give up on her. God does not divorce us. God does not abandon us. God does not leave us. God is 100% faithful to us no matter how unfaithful we've been to him. And I thank God for that because none of us, including myself, have been that faithful to God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 13 says this, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. It doesn't matter how you've been or how I've been. How God is, is he's faithful. Always faithful. I've, I've, I've actually developed some truth statements for us tonight. You can write these down and say these as well. Put the truth statement up there. God is faithful to me. I want you to say this out loud or say it in your heart. I don't care, but you need to say this tonight. God is faithful to me. There is nothing I have done or will do that will cause God to turn his back on me. That's the truth. You know why you need to say these things? Because the devil likes to lie to us. The devil gets us to believe things that aren't true about ourselves and that aren't true about God. And so sometimes... It doesn't even take the devil. Sometimes even just our situations and our own, you know, personal, you know, feelings come out. And, and God, the devil even has to trick us or lie to us. We lie to ourselves sometimes. So it's, I think it's good to have truth statements sometimes that we repeat, we remember. This is the truth. You know how the Bible says that uh, capture every evil thought? Take every thought captive, make it obedient to Christ. That's what we're doing right here. The thought that God is not faithful, that God doesn't love me, that God has abandoned me, that God has turned away from me, is an absolute lie. This is what the Bible says. God is faithful to me. There's nothing I have done or will do that will cause God to turn his back on me. Every time the devil tells us a lie, we will pronounce the truth. Number two tells us in 431, after, this, after it says he won't abandon us, says that he will not destroy you. God is not wanting to bring destruction on this earth. He has done it out of necessity. But his desire, specifically with his elect, those who are watching, those who are here tonight, his schedule is not to destroy you. His future, your future is not that he is against you or is going to destroy you. He is not against us. He does not want to hurt us. He is not the one who tempts us. James chapter 113 tells us that. It's quite the opposite. When it comes to God's elect, He has plans to prosper you. We all know that scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11. God has plans to prosper you, plans to bless you, plans to give you hope, plans to give you a future, no plans to harm you at all. That's not God's plan, nor is he doing it. God is not harming you. God is not hurting you. God is not against you. God is not trying to destroy you. If you feel that in your heart or you thought that, you need to recognize tonight that it's a lie. God's not destroying you. God is helping you. God is your helper. His Holy Spirit is even translated as the helper in the New Testament. He's not there to harm. He's there to help. He is by your side. He is prospering you. He has a future for you. He has hope for you. He will not destroy you. I love how Romans 8.31 says it. Some, there's a larger passage to this and there's a greater context. But sometimes we miss the little things when we read all the big things. But I just want you to look at the little part of Romans 8.31. Here's what it says. God is for us. 
We read sometimes so fast that we miss the smaller part. If God is for us, who can be against us? But listen, God, this is just stopping that one part. God is for us. God is for you, not against you. God is for you. He is on your side. Truth statement number two tonight, God is on my side. Put it up there. God is going to help you. I don't care what you're going through, what you're experiencing, or what you will experience, or what you will go through. God is on your side. He is with you. He is going to help you. God is a merciful God, church. Finally this, because God is a merciful God, He will not forget the promises that He's made to you. He won't forget you, and He won't forget the promises that He's made to you. You are so special to God. We are so important to God. We can sometimes look at the immensity of creation and all that there is and all the people who have ever lived and all their thoughts and prayers and their lives. But in all those things, God doesn't miss a single detail. He doesn't miss a single person. He is in all and with all. He is in you. And He knows you so intimately. There's no possible way that God could forget you. As a matter of fact... Uh, I believe it's true when some commentators talk about when Jesus hung on the cross and you went through his mind. I believe we're always on God's mind, individually, not just corporately. He knows you. He loves you. He has plans for you. And so he promises that he will not forget the promises that he's made to you. He's not forgotten us or any of the promises that he's made to you. You know, that can be directly or indirectly. This one specifically speaks this passage of those promises he's given to our ancestors that have been inherited by us. Okay, there are still promises in this book all over the place that are promises to our ancestors, to our early believers that are passed on and inherited by us. These promises aren't just the promises for the people in the Bible. They are your promises. You are the elect. These are your promises. So those are indirect promises passed down to us, but there are also personal promises. Promises that maybe you know about, that you've heard from God particularly, specifically. When you've been with Him in devotions, praying, talking to God, reading His Word, that you've recognized, this is something God has promised me. God does not forget those promises, those plans that He has for you. He's not forgotten about those. He is still pursuing you, and He's still pursuing His promises to be fulfilled in your life. He's going to do everything he's ever promised to do for you. God will deliver on his word. He is good for it. God has great things in store for you. Great things. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says this, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. That means they're absolutes. God cannot lie. The one thing he cannot do, the Bible says, cannot lie. Cannot lie. His promises are yes and amen. Truth statement number three, and I close with this. Rachel, you can come back to the piano. I am important to God. God has great things for my future. I think we can be so hard on ourselves sometimes that we need to focus on God's mercy. Stand with me all over the sanctuary. Perhaps that's you tonight. Perhaps... You've been hard on yourself, down on yourself, feeling worthless, feeling like good enough. I think the devil constantly tries to lie to us every day. He might try to get in our minds. He, if you control your thoughts, he can control your actions. If you can control your thoughts, he can make you do things you shouldn't do and don't want to do. Start feeling certain ways you shouldn't start feeling. And, and I think we should counter this with the truth. The psalmist said it best when he said it this way. He says, your mercies are new every single morning. His mercies don't stop. They endure forever. They're always available to us, and we're always receiving them. There's not a time in your life that you haven't had His mercy by your side, at your hand, right there waiting for you. So I give this message to you on behalf of God. He loves you. He's got plans for you. He's not going to destroy you. He's always by your side. He's got great things for your life. And he'll never forget what he's promised you. He's bringing it to fulfillment tonight.
So I want to pray tonight. I'm going to open the altars if anyone would like to come and pray for anything at all. Then I welcome you. Perhaps you're here tonight and you say, well, I <laughs> didn't realize I was one of the elect. I'm here tonight because I'm seeking God. Well, I want you to know He's already chosen you, and I'm glad that you're now wanting to choose Him. You can get saved tonight. God will wipe away every sin, every stain that has ever been committed in your life, and He'll make you His child tonight because He's already chosen you. He's already wanting to. If that's you tonight, if you're ready to give your life to Jesus and acknowledge that, then I ask you to come forward tonight and talk to me. Come talk to one of the pastors, Pastor Terry, Pastor Pop. We'll all be here tonight if you want to come talk with us. Altars are open. You can be dismissed when you're done. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this evening for your graciousness. And tonight, Lord, your mercy, it's upon us. You're not giving us what we deserve. You love us so much that you have a deep compassion. You look at us, Lord, and you pity us. And you want to give to us, and you want to love us, and you want to forgive us. And so, Lord, we accept your forgiveness tonight. We thank you that it's there for us. We thank you for your promises. We thank you, God, that you've not abandoned us. You'll always be with us. Thank you, God, for the life that you give us. And I pray that everybody would experience and understand fully what that is tonight. Your love is so deep. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Find a place now where you can spend time with Jesus.